Welcome to Stories and Song, the series of interviews with musicians from the world of jazz and improvisation. Um, I'm Sophia Carbonara, and it's my great pleasure today to be talking to Gemma Farrell. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my first question you. for you, uh, what have been the pivotal events in your musical journey? Um, so probably the um, events that um, the most pivotal um, that I can think of would be uh, like when I first started studying jazz at uni. Um, actually, not even when I first started studying, um, but like some time into my journey, um, I I had a and I guess um your second question will cover this a bit as well. I had a bit of a hard time. Um, here in Perth, um, when I when I first sort of was trying to come onto the scene, um, there weren't many girls, and um, yeah, I had a, I had a, I, it felt like I had a lot of um, lecturers telling me how I should sound, without telling me how to actually <laughs> improve, and and what to work on, and so I was sort of just practicing completely like with no idea um yeah so um sort of frustrated with that I um I went to I, I took a trip to Sydney and got some lessons with Sandy Evans and um that was a time where I was like oh yeah I was really just not sure if I should give up my instrument I I I never really wanted to give up but I was sort of thinking like oh I'll have some time off, I'll practice, and then I'll come back to it. Um, and, yeah, Sandy was like, no, 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 I, I think you should keep going. I think you I think you should um, look, like I, I said, oh, another option that I considered was studying elsewhere. And um, she was like, yeah, you should 100% do that. And I, um, I moved to, um, so from talking to Sandy I, I, um, and from her encouraging me to keep going, I um, contacted some other universities on the eastern side of Australia. I uh, I um, I moved to I ended up moving to Brisbane, um, where they had Louise Denson running the jazz department there. Um, yeah, and she is still like she and Sandy. Um, like quite big heroes of mine and 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 people who really encouraged me and are just great jazz musicians and I also had Graham Norris there as a saxophone teacher and he he was a really great saxophone teacher he was sort of the first person to be like this is what a 251 is and here's some licks and like you should check out this person's playing and and was like yeah it was the first I, I sort of, I don't even know if now I'd say I get jazz. <laughs> well, like I get jazz. I, well, I like jazz a lot, um, but in terms of like I, I am far from having mastered it and I don't know if anyone ever feels like they've mastered it. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, I, I um, he was sort of the first person to show me what it's all about and and yeah what to work on and I really needed that um so yeah moving to Brisbane um meeting Sandy and then from um after my time in Brisbane I moved to Holland um to do a master's and I I sort of uh thought that uh you know it would be the the lecturers would be absolutely incredible um, when, when the truth of it was that um, a lot of them were really old and over teaching and <laughs> um, and but what was cool about um, being in Amsterdam was that uh, there were so many different people from all over the world um, and you know if you you can think of any unusual genre and there'd be the kind of people there who would want to like there was a jazz French horn player and, you know, there were incredible recorder players and there were um, people who studied Balkan music and, like, just any genre you could think of. Like, yeah, um, 
So that was sort of the first time where I, I, I guess not the first time I made my own um, project that was more in Queensland, but the first time I really seriously um, like delved into writing my own originals and um, yeah, I, I know that like there was a moment there where I was like, um, okay, the key to my happiness here is like, I'll just do what I need to do to pass the subjects and get the qualification, but the key to my happiness here um, and satisfying, I guess, my own cre creativity is hanging out with these other musicians and forming groups and organising gigs. And um, that was the first time that I really got into that, which is something that I do all the time now. So, yeah, that was pretty important for my development. Beautiful so much, um movement inter intercontinental and cross-continental and some of the, some of your answer relates to this but leads to the second question uh, what obstacles have you had to overcome during your musical life and how have you dealt with them yeah so um yeah I sort of mentioned what I went through uh early in my development um yeah I I had um some of the teachers I dealt with have have since been fired <laughs> for good reason um, so, some of them uh, are just no longer involved in the Perth uh, jazz industry and and I, I think that's a really good thing. The, the, the culture here is completely different now and it's, it's so good. Um, but, yeah, sort of overcoming that and wondering if I, I really want to be part of something like that um, or and, – and I guess um, – Part of that was because of gender discrimination um, and I guess um, particularly so meeting Sandy um, was also really good for me because when I moved back to Perth after living in Holland, um, Sandy, well, Wajo West Australian Youth Jazz Orchestra were looking at um, starting her program here, the Young Women in Jazz program and uh, and um, yeah, when they were talking to Sandy about that, she knew that I was moving back to Perth and she was like, this is who you have to have run it for you because I'd been to Sydney and I'd seen how the course works there. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I, and, and uh, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm blubbing a bit, um, getting sidetracked, but my, like, uh, I sort of realised when I came back um, just how important gender diversity was through my work with uh, running the Young Women in Jazz course, which um, we now call the Progressions course here in Perth. Um, and then I sort of, it was around the, the Me Too era time that um, I sort of realised that like while we're trying to do things to address um address these challenges um through education we also needed to have it reflected on the stage um so that's when i um formed the artemis orchestra and i you know uh looked at what the sirens big band had done in um sydney um and yeah i i spoke to a lot of those girls who i knew um from having seen the Young Women in Jazz course in Sydney. And, uh, yeah, I, and I think now a, an ongoing challenge is gender, di gender diversity. Uh, like, it's to be 100% honest with you, it's not something I want to have to spend my time on. <laughs> like, I, I got into jazz to play the saxophone and I'd love to spend 100% of my time doing that. <laughs> um but it, it's really important and I guess um, it, it's quite upsetting to me when I see gigs advertised, um, like we have a big band here called the WA Jazz Project. It only has two women in it. Um, I hate that it claims to represent WA and yet it's not, that's not a reflection of the WA that I know. Um, and, and there was one, another one recently called the Perth All Star Big Band, and again, no women. Um, and it, it just frustrates me, like, because I, I really see the way of 
uh, tackling this issue is is that we have to have it represented on the stage. So whenever I see, like it's it's frustrating when it's a small group under a, a guy's name, say the John Smith Quartet, and they're all boys. Like that's that's frustrating as well, because you know, I think in every city that I know of, so I, I've spent time in Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth. And uh, I, I haven't actually ever been to Adelaide, but I know of um, the, the movements happening there um, for gender diversity on the stage. Um, so I can confidently say in those cities we have enough women who play well enough. Like there's no, it's not an excuse anymore that there's not enough women who play that well. <laughs> like that's just crap in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, it, it does get me down whenever I see things like that advertised, um, particularly when they claim to represent a city or a, a nation or a state. Um, but I guess I, it's, it's really important to me. So I, I keep talking about it at gigs, particularly at Artemis gigs. I always talk about why we're doing what we're doing. Um, yeah. I, I I just keep trying to work on it and um, whenever I'm forming a new band now, I would never not do at least 50-50 if not more. And, and through um, my work through gender diversity, I've become aware of other important types of diversity as well, like racial diversity. Um, a lot of the bands we have in here, here in Perth are all white. Um, and that is unfortunately a reflection of the scene, but there are more and more people of colour coming into the scene. And, you know, I feel like pretty soon it'll be similar. Like you can't, it's it's not good enough to see an all white band. And, and that's a good thing. Like in my opinion, when you when you have more diversity, you know, when you play with people who are different than you, you hear a different voice, a different opinion, um, it makes the music more interesting. So why wouldn't you? Yeah, it, I guess it, it's frustrating when you see all all guy bands advertised, not because I need or want the work because I, I have enough work, but just because by not seeing anyone who looks like me in that band, I just feel like it's not sending a good message to the younger generation and I feel like it's kind of like, well, we don't want to work with people like you. You know, it, it does kind of feel a bit personal in a way. Um, and I guess to, to go back to your question, um, I definitely have had uh, struggles with imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, I was taking an Artemis rehearsal last night and just, yeah, standing in front of the band with, which is full of other amazing professional jazz musicians. I, I'm sort of always like, oh crap, <laughs> am I really the best person for this job? Um, and and um, and also like I I uh, particularly after having my children, um, I had some struggles with mental health. And um, you know, uh, two days ago we lost um, a a pretty prominent Perth jazz musician to suicide. Um, so I kind of feel like it's something that, like, people need to hear that other people go through these things and, and it's normal and it's it's awful. Um, but, you know, it's okay not to be okay. Um, so, yeah, I've definitely um, had my struggles with uh, mental health and, and I guess... Um, how have I dealt with them? Um, uh, I guess I always try to find ways that uh, music still, like uh, with mental health, I pretty much wrote a whole album of music that was about like sort of what I was struggling with and uh, my journey to get better. And um, with, uh, yeah, gender diversity, my, my answer was to form the Artemis Orchestra and 
my answer when I get frustrated with these bands is to just keep doing the opposite and keep talking about it and hope that, you know, I, I feel like if it just makes one person feel better or, um, or one, um, or, or like one girl go like, Oh, I am welcome in the jazz scene, then it's worth it. And, um, I guess with, um, yeah, I, I always try and listen to my favourite musicians, um, find people to look up to. Um, you know, my answer when I was struggling back in uni was to find Sandy. It was sort of I, – I, I didn't really know her music. Um, I, I was sort of just like I know there's this amazing female saxophone player in Perth. I've got to find her. I've got to have – it. sorry, not in Perth, in Australia. I've got to find her. I've got to have lessons with her. And, um, yeah, and she was an incredible or is an incredible person and musician. And, yeah, I, I hope that somewhat answers the question. Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned the younger generation. I guess my next question is, do you have a motto or a personal philosophy that guides you? Or what advice would you share with younger musicians? And I um, everybody, but... Well, yeah, a, a couple of things like um, – yeah, well, well, with young women and non-binary and transgender people, I would just say, well, well, particularly with, and it it doesn't have to be just jazz. I guess if there's anyone wanting to get an in, into an industry, and there's not people who look like you, like that, I think that means more than ever that you're needed in that industry. <laughs> And um, it sucks because you may not feel welcome because of that. And and I know that I still in a lot of ways feel out of place in the jazz scene. Um, but I also know that um, there's a like a whole generation of young women who are coming up and are great musicians. And if I can be somewhat of an inspiration for them to to even check out a jazz record, like they don't have to choose a career in it, but to 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 know that they can be involved and be welcome, uh, I think that's worth it. Um, other other things I, I wrote some down. Um, I I feel like uh, uni students in particular need to know that there are no stupid questions. <laughs> Um, and I really stress that one because I, I like particularly in my early uni, uni days, I, um, I was really like afraid that I might sound stupid if I asked a question. Like I remember very clearly my, um, my saxophone teacher saying like outline the six more and just having no clue whatever, what that meant. Like, and and, like, I wish I had have said, what does that mean? Because that would have showed him, like, oh, okay, well, she must sound like she knows a bit because she's checked out a bit of jazz, but she actually doesn't know what she's doing. <laughs> and, and like, helped me to understand. And, and like, last night um, I had an Artemis rehearsal and we had, in the middle of a really long phrase, we had a, a minim triplet sort of three over four rhythm and one of the band members stuck up their hand and said I'm sorry to ask a stupid question but how does that rhythm go and like it turned out the whole band was like because even if you look at it and you know that well that's three notes in the space of four beats you still need to know how that sounds in your head and be able to switch to that rhythm after you're doing sort of more uh I guess, rhythmically consonant <laughs> rhythms. Um, yeah, so then the whole band worked on it after that and, then, like, it turned out multiple people in the band were going, like, what the hell? <laughs> so, yeah, just there's no stupid questions. Um, I also I really feel like it's it's super important to, um, to support local musicians and um, I know that students are often poor, um, but you can do that by um, sharing 
uh, like if there's a great gig that you want to go to or you just like someone's music, like put up a video or a link on, on Facebook or something like that. Um, yeah, there's many ways you can support your local music scene and I I sort of I I support the local Perth music scene because well not only because I want there to be a thriving Perth jazz scene but also uh, because I I'd hope that you know when I put out albums and put on gigs that people are like oh yeah I I might go to Gemma's gig or I might buy her album if she does the same for me and I sort of believe that we've all got to support each other um and and I guess supporting each other uh comes to my next one um not seeing other musicians as competition um or 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 not comparing yourself to other musicians like um you know there's there's a couple of styles that um, if someone asked me to do a super avant-garde gig, I'd definitely be keen to give it a go, but it's it's probably not my forte. And and if I if I uh, didn't feel comfortable, I I would say that it's not my forte. And and but that's that's okay. Like if someone wants someone who can do hard bop, like I'm probably the person you'd call for that. And, you know, we all have our specialties and we're all, like, running our own race. We've got to, like, we, we, have to, we have to strive to be better, but we have to also not be too hard on ourselves, keep the goals in mind, but, but you know, cut ourselves some slack. And, you know, if you like another musician's playing and they live in the same city as you, um, you know, that's okay. You be inspired by them. Don't see them as the competition and help support them and just think, okay, well, he might be called for those gigs, but I'm called for these gigs. So that's cool. And, and, and try not to sweat too much over that stuff. I know I did when I was younger. And I, I think also moving to Brisbane, um, like there were other saxophone players there who became my friends and like, I was, it was sort of the first time I didn't see other sax players as, as a threat. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it, um, I think it's, yeah, just important to keep those things in mind. And in terms of a saying, um, one of my favourite ones is uh, good artists borrow and great artists steal. Um, and that's just because, like, um, I think transcribing is, is really helpful and, you know, if you transcribe lots of different players and you work on their licks, you know, let's say you check out Miles Davis and then you check out John Coltrane and then you check out um, Tia Fuller and maybe Andrea Keller, you know, you're not going to sound like when you put all of that in the U mixing pot you're not going to sound like you're copying Miles Davis or Andrew Keller. You're, you're going to just sound like you because after a while those things become a part of you. And, um, yeah, so when whenever my students, like especially my younger students occasionally, they might be like, are you sure it's okay to, to use this lick <laughs> and, or, or, or something like that? And I'm just like, this is how you learn the language. It, it's an oral art form. Yeah. That's be thank you. That's really some beautiful, was beautiful words to words to share. Um, so my my last question of you is talking about support, and also you mentioned an album earlier. But would you elect a, a song or an album for us to listen to? Uh, okay. yeah. I I thought about this. Um, um, probably the Valleys. Um, uh, it's from my album um, Organized Chaos, uh, which was the first album with my quintet so like probably if I wanted to show off my quintet it may not be because it was quite early so it may not be the track I show I, I pick but uh, composition wise like I know I wrote it 
uh, I was having like a really bad mental health day when I wrote it. And um, my doctor described like the process of getting better as like having peaks and valleys. And so some days are good and some days are really crap. And so it was sort of like, okay, well, this is what the crappy days sound like in my head. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, that, that was quite a, a while ago. Um, but it's, it's, it's very cool to, to look back on that song for a couple of reasons, like to know that I got better and to also listen to it and hear that my quintet's come a long way since that recording as well. It was really beautiful. I'm looking forward to, to listening to it. And I hope those here at the studio as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much. No for worries. Having... Thank you for having me.